Uh, session is now recorded. So I'll start again a little bit. Um, color is the most important visual variable that you can use to generate um, effective visualizations. And what I'm going to talk about today applies both to um, geographical visualizations like choropleth maps and dot maps and things like that, as well as uh, to other kinds of visualizations where you're going to use color. And that's because I'm going to talk today about color maps. A color map is not a geographical entity. <laughs> that would be a choropleth map. A color, a color map is a, a sort of set of colors that are assigned to values in a given um, sort of aesthetic. And the, the way that color maps are used in scientific visualization is, is quite important. Um, so here you'll see that I've made this choropleth map, which is spelled C-H-O-R-O-P-L-E-T-H. Lots of people confuse choropleth with Another word, chloropleth. Uh, but if I'm making a map where I have a bunch of polygons and those are colored in a particular way, that is a choropleth map. Choro for color and pleth meaning value. So choropleth maps are the main way that we visualize data in geography. And it's also the main way that we um, interact with color as a visual variable. So this is a really big part of computer cartography. And I won't have a big, uh, a big amount of time to talk to you today about kind of the concepts in computer cartography and things like that. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to just give you the basic um, rundown of computer cartography as it was taught to me. Uh, and maybe give you uh, some color theory uh, as part of that. So first off here, you see this map on the right side. I'm using the uh, geom sf function to make maps with ggplot, and I find that to be pretty useful. Um, when describing a map, you have the graticule, which is like the grid lines that you see in a standard map. And sometimes you might have a base map, which uh, is usually an image like a Google map or uh, something like um, the Stamen toner map, which I'll put in the chat, um, that you can use to uh, kind of give geographical context to your map. So you put that underneath the data that you're going to plot. But then nearly all geographical visualizations involve something to do with color. And there's a few fundamental things that are important to think about when you're talking about color in geography. The first one is whether or not your color map is continuous or if it's discrete. Technically, a choropleth map has to have a discrete color map. In this map, my color map is continuous. By this, I mean that the color bar has a continuous mapping from every color to a value. In this case, I'm using the default color map, which is black to blue, and it takes every single value that I have in my data and assigns it a color. And that color is generally unique, unless two values share the same uh, numerical value unless two rows share the same numerical value. The alternative to this is using map classification. And so in, in uh, R, we would use something like scale, fill, discrete to do this. Oh, whoops. Um, uh, you might actually have to apply a map classifier to get the 
classifications here. But generally, if you use like a GIS program with that built in, you'll get individual kind of discrete color maps. Here, I'll show you what a discrete color map looks like by you maybe visualizing something like LA name, which is already a factor. So a discrete color map involves distinctive classes for each variable. OK? So if I um, maybe said uh, if I had to make a map with five classes, let's say, for price, I might quantify the price using something like the quantile function. And that gives me the breaks that I'm looking for. I believe that there's an easier way to do this. And I'm not, I don't quite remember what that is. But I'm just illustrating the point here. So I'm not, I don't expect you to be using, um, using this in your, your own maps. So I'm sure that there's a better way to do this. And I'm probably doing this in a way that is uh, more complicated than is necessary. Um, but I just want to show you what this looks like. Hmm. All right. Um, okay, so maybe I won't because it seems like I'm not able to get here very quickly. I'm, I'm less knowledgeable about computer cartography in R. I make most of my maps in Python, and it's a little different there. So uh, again, the main point is the distinction between a continuous color map and a discrete color map. A continuous color map is like we saw before with the prices, where you have a continuous value that maps from an individual um, value to an individual color. And that's usually distinctive uh, for every polygon. And a discrete color map is a color map where there are distinctive values for every unique, um, uh, distinctive colors for every unique value in your data. And the process of what they call map classification or a map classifier uh, entails mapping or, or a function that takes the original values in your data and gives them into a bin, kind of like a histogram, and reps represents them with the color. So as far as computer cartography stuff is concerned, a lot of what you'll see online is about choosing the right kind of map classification and choosing the right kind of color map and things like that. So um, I don't really want to get into that very much because I think that that's best suited for a full course in computer cartography. Uh, but I do want to make sure that you're aware that choices about discrete versus continuous color maps as well as um, the kind of classification algorithm can have serious impacts on the ways that your, your data uh, appears. One of the clearest instances is that when um, map classification algorithms, you're going to exaggerate the differences between observations. And when using, um, when using continuous colors, you're generally going to de-emphasize the differences between observations. Um, but again, I, I'm not stressing this. It's just kind of a general uh, impression or advice here. So the other thing that I wanted to show you is the difference between um, uh, is the difference between maybe it's scale fill bind. Yes, there we go. Okay, so scale fill bind will bin the data like a histogram, it'll put it into different classes and then map that to unique color. So the contrast there is that this one is continuous. And this one has compressed the number of colors that are shown into four individual colors on the right here, you see. So if you make a continuous color map, you're going to see a lot more kind of shades of variation. And if you make a binned map, you're going to uh, see a lot less, but it's going to magnify the inequalities where you see them. So you see how in this map, um, 
you have some areas in the left of Bristol that are uh, very apparently blue and light, whereas in this map that variation is much more um, kind of has a has a clearer gradient. So in this one they kind of stick out, and in this one they kind of smoothly change. So uh, in general, um, when you're dealing with scale, uh, color scales and things like that. Uh, the advice that I've seen is to make sure that you're not making a map with more than seven discrete color classes and that humans, generally speaking, fail to distinguish differences in color by that point. Um, so there's a lot of cartographic theory that suggests that we should be making binned maps because that allows us to draw sort of color comparisons much better than these kinds of smoother maps. Is this only if the colors are on a scale? Yeah. So if you're just making a unique values map, uh, humans still only have the ability to differentiate about seven colors in the same image. So you know, if you're talking about having three or four different shades of green, um, then you're going to have a, a problem. Uh, even if they're completely different, yeah. Even if hues are completely different, once you get to about seven evenly spaced hues across a rainbow, people start having difficulty differentiating them in a systematic fashion because the, the, the that you're around can affect your perception of the color that you are. Um, yeah, so that there are cultural differences in that. Uh, I believe you can specify the number of bins in the scale filled bin command, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so, hmm. Hmm. yeah, I'm not quite sure. Uh, there should be a way to do that, though. Um, options. Nope. Um. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Uh, again, as I said, I, I generally uh, don't uh, use this stuff myself for making maps. I use it in a very exploratory fashion, so I'm not quite familiar with all of the different options for uh, computer cartography. Um, but I just wanted to kind of conceptually introduce you to the difference between a continuous color map, which has um, I'm just going to rerun it so that it's easier to see. A continuous color map, which has every kind of unique value in the data mapped to a distinctive color, versus a binned map, which discretizes the data into different classes. Now, again, I'm, I'm not telling you this is like a rule of law. You must do all this. You know, you must bin your maps before you plot them. Humans can only differentiate seven colors, and I'll fail you if I see eight. Like. This is all kind of extremely subjective, and um, you know there are different kinds of studies that attempt to estimate what individuals, uh, you know, are able to do with scientific visualizations. So I'm just giving you these as like my summary of what I know about this stuff. Uh, I'm not a cartographer. I've never worked as a cartographer. Well, that's a lie. I've worked as a cartographer briefly in industry. Uh, obviously, if I was better at cartography, I probably would have been employed for longer. <laughs> um, but I did work as a cartographer for a little bit. Uh, so generally speaking, I would advise you to make the differences on your maps really clear. And generally speaking, that's done using binning uh, and, and using these kinds of color maps. So I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about this. So the other thing that I wanted to discuss is the actual choice of color maps. So by default, the colors that you're, you're generally going to make in, um, in R are these kinds of black to blue color maps. And I've, saw, I've seen plenty of these before um, in maps that people have used before. And then the other thing is that when you use uh, ggplot, it'll kind of use these default color maps as well. So you want to... You want to kind of get a sense of how to use color and develop like a visual style or maybe just learn about the different color maps. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that today. So there are kind of two schools of thought uh, when it comes to choosing color maps and thinking about how color maps work. 
So one incredibly famous project in digital cartography is the Color Brewer, um, Color Brewer uh, project. And this is put together by a woman named Cynthia Brewer at uh, Penn State. And she has done a lot of human uh, subjects research on what color maps work the best for individuals. So like what colors and color configurations can I use to um, make good maps, basically. And I'm now going to switch my application screen to us. OK, so now that's the Stamen Toner base map, which is probably my favorite base map. Um, but let's see here. Where is the Color Brewer? OK, cool. So Color Brewer um, is a great kind of environment in which to show a couple of different concepts about color maps. So what I'm going to show you here is the difference between sequential, diverging, and qualitative color maps, which are sometimes called unique values color maps. Um, I have just realized when I'm in this, I cannot see your questions in the chat. So uh, I'll just hear that there are bubbles. Um, so I might hold on questions for a second until I'm done just demonstrating the concepts of colors and color maps. So the color maps that you've been using by default in R are what are called sequential color maps in most cases. These are, generally speaking, one or two hue color maps. So a hue is like a color. And then uh, the shading or the brightness, sometimes uh, saturation is varied as well. Um, that is the thing that is usually allowed to vary. So in a single hue color map, we're only working with, say, blue as a hue. And then we visualize low values as a lighter blue and high values as a darker blue. Or the other way around. You illustrate one end of the value distribution with light color, another end of the distribution with a dark color. And so all of these are single hue sequential maps. And they all have special little like names in the color brewer scenario. And this one is a three color map. This one is a five color map. And you can see now there are more gradations in this map. The color brewer only lets you go to nine in single color maps sequential because uh, Cynthia's research has suggested that uh, humans are not really good at differentiating more than that on a map. You can see that the uncertainties between, say, that color and that color when they're surrounded by another color get really vague. So this is what I was talking about, Hannah, uh, in the chat where, yeah, you know, we might be able to visually pick out a bunch of different colors, but generally speaking, the context in which you see a particular polygon or point is going to affect the way that that color hits your brain. So you're actually going to be less accurate in making comparisons in maps with a lot of uh, really fine gradations of color. Keep in mind that the point of a map is both to kind of be a presentation of data and then also uh, something that's aesthetically pleasing. So in those situations, remember, I cannot hear or read your questions as I've got this up. Um, I might actually try and fix that. I'll go here, boom. And then what window do you see? The wrong window. So I'm going to stop and restart to share the color brewer. OK, great. Everybody can see the color brewer, and you can screw around with this on your own because it sent the URL in there. Hannah asked, is this only the case for maps? What if it was an XY plot? Well, um, the suggestion is that uh, only for maps, because so, uh, Cynthia is a, 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 a cartographer. Um, but again, like I would suggest that you want to minimize the amount of extra variation that you're using. And you want to think really hard about the thing that you're showing the person. So if you have all these like billions of colors displayed on your map, you need to be really cautious about what that message is conveying and whether or not that diagram is interpretable at a glance. The best diagrams use a very small amount of ink and are very obvious in what they're trying to show you. So making a diagram more complicated by using more colors generally is a bad idea and is considered bad practice in visualization and cartography. Now, if you think it looks nice, 
make it that way. You know, there, there's there's plenty of people that disagree about the aesthetics of cartography uh, and the aesthetics and visualization. But what I'm showing you here is just kind of a teaching environment for um, what I would call the canonical view of uh, cartography in in at least my admittedly American upbringing uh, uh, in, in the field. So the, the color brewer perspective, color brewer is indeed in ggplot. You can find um, methods to use color brewer in ggplot. I believe it's built in. Anything that you see as brewer, like scale fill brewer, is going to be color brewer. Um, and so I, I, I want to kind of move to talking a little bit about multi-hue maps. So this is an example of a multi-hue map where the lighter end of the spectrum is then given a different color, a different hue. So in this map, I'm showing you the YLGNBU map. You can see here that this is the name that I'm reading off there. So YLGNBU. And this is a sequential color map because it's still encoding the fact that yellow values are either high or in the middle and blue values are low, um, or you know, conversely, blue values indicate intensity and white values indicate sort of uh, lack of intensity. So this is a multi-hue color map because the two ends of the map are using different hues, okay? And these are all sequential because they all kind of have this same gradient-based interpretation that at the very low end, We've got something that's light, and that could be in a multi-hue map, light yellow or light pink or something. And at the other end, we've got a really deep and intense color. In diverging color maps, we oftentimes use two separate hues. So nearly all diverging color maps are two or three hue maps. In a diverging color map, we have some intrinsically meaningful zero or middle point that we're trying to show. And then on either end, we have the high values and the low values. So a diverging color map makes people think that the data has two ends, right? So if I'm making a plot of counts of things, I don't necessarily want to use a diverging color map because counts go from zero all the way up to our top value. That's kind of like a sequential variable. A diverging variable might be, um, I don't know, the change in house prices or the change in COVID rates or something. So that can be negative, it can be positive, and it has a meaningful zero. So we would use a diverging color map. Now, diverging color maps are still, you know, uh, they, they, generally speaking, you know, in, in the classic kind of standard canon of cartography, uh, you can use more colors or more classes in a diverging color map. And diverging color maps can also be continuous. Here I'm just showing you the discrete ones um, because they're to kind of demonstrate. But the, 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 the point here is just that um, diverging, you have a meaningful zero and ends that are supposed to be like different values or different kind of conceptual representations. And, you know, you might like <clears throat> some of these different color maps. Uh, I'll get to showing you how to set diverging color scales in R, but basically you, you pick the diverging color map that you want. So by specifying a color map, you, uh, you can get exactly what you request. I think in the assignment I'm using uh, color brewer when I'm making the maps. So if you want to go look at the, the code there, I think I'm specifying color brewer, yeah, in 1.4. I'm using color brewer tones there. I think one of them I'm using the, the greens color map, this one, and then in another one I'm using a different one. So um, you can you can kind of specify those things and I've shown you how to do that in the code. Um, I'll get to your question, Noah, in a second. I just want to finish on the diverging. So in the diverging maps, um, you have this kind of one hue runs through white to another hue. Another kind of intentionally used thing is uh, using yellow as your neutral color. Um, I 
my favorite color map, rather than the what's called like a, a red blue or BWR sometimes, is you know blue, white, red, where blue indicates low values, red indicates high values, and white indicates the middle, or sometimes red indicates low values, blue indicates high values. It just depends on your kind of visualization strategy. Um, many people like this map. I like having yellow as the neutral color. I think it makes the map look a little bit warmer, uh, and it just looks nicer to look at and, and is easier for me to draw contrast, especially as uh, the color numbers get really big. But um, in general, yeah, the, the, these are the diverging color maps that run from one color, like red, to another color, like blue, through some kind of neutral light tone, like white or yellow. And then you've also got other kinds of diverging color maps, like so. OK? So these are the diverging color maps. They're two hue, always. And the thing that's on one end has an opposite interpretation of the thing at the other end. And you want to assign some significance to the thing in the middle. OK? Cool. So Noah asks, especially when using sequential variables, is there a good way to decide which way around you should set the colors? Dark is high, light is low. Um, yeah, that can be the case. Uh, generally speaking, people interpret dark things as more important. So if your variable of interest is so that um, the, the kind of, if, you're, if your variable of interest is like a count, let's say, this is the easiest way for me to think about these things, then generally speaking, we would set large values of counts to be the dark color. Um, but it's, it's like if you're talking about something where you, you know, there are always choices that you can make that will contradict this advice. So I'm just, the conventional way is when you're doing sequential maps, um, you have the dark color be the high value and the light color be the low value. And this is related to the principle that we were talking about the other day, uh, which is the principle of uh, least ink. So you want to spend all of the ink that you can showing the important thing. And the converse of that is p things that have a lot of ink are going to be interpreted as more important. So colors that are darker are going to be seen like bigger, more important, more significant in the map. Your eye will be drawn to them over the areas that are lighter. So you need to be careful about that. And if what you're doing is to communicate like counts, Generally speaking, we want to indicate places that have a high count. So we use a sequential color map with dark colors being high counts. But if you want to tell a different story, you can pick a different color map or a different representation. OK? Now, there are two more things I wanted to mention here. <clears throat> um, the, the next thing is that uh, in cartography, they call qualitative color maps uh, kind of the unique values color map. So if what I want to show is that there are unique values, like uh, names of things, but I don't want to indicate that these have some kind of continuum, like as I showed before, the map of the uh, local authorities, there's no real ordering in the colors. It's just one of them should be red, one of them should be blue, one of them should be pink. And if I just want different colors, that's called a qualitative color map. So picking qualitative color maps, there's kind of two different strategies. Um, one of them is just like you pick ones that have these kind of dark colors. You know, you can go pastel, you can go dark, but they all kind of have the same thing, that they're all just colors, they're thrown on the map, they're picked to be really distinctive, but they are not necessarily, um, you know, paired in any way. They're just colors that are picked to be distinctive. Then you can also have what are called, uh, we'll get exactly to that in a hot minute, Hannah. Um, great question. The next thing I wanted to just mention about these qualities is that you can also pick what are called paired colors. So in this instance, you have different categories that might be represented uh, using different colors, but they might be two parts of the same subcategory or larger category. They might be subcategories of a larger category. So here, the two red hues 
will be interpreted as part of the same kind of band. And the two green hues will be interpreted as the same kind of like green class. So these are called paired qualitative color maps. And that's because each red has a, a second red or a third red. Each green has its own other green. But then the blue and the green and the red are seen as separate from one another. So these are called paired color maps. OK? So between all those different things, uh, that's kind of the, the canonical knowledge in computer cartography about picking color maps. And Color Brewer is a very long-standing, very well-adopted uh, thing for computer cartography. Now, the nice thing is that lots of people are quite aware of color blindness when it comes to designing um, maps and visualizations. And so there are, increasingly speaking, a lot of tools that simulate different uh, varieties of color blindness. So lots of people think that there's only really one type of color blindness, but there's a family of color blindness diseases. And, and no, I, I don't. I mean, like, yeah, I guess they're biologically elemented, so I would call them a disease. But you know what I mean. Um, color blindness can come in a lot of different variants, and it can affect the perception of color in different ways. So there are, generally speaking, no single colorblind safe color map. So this is why you want to be sensitive to the number of classes that you're using and you want to maximize the visual contrast between hues. So you want to avoid making direct comparisons between classes that are at the same sort of saturation, which means like you wouldn't want a map of two colors that are of the same amount. Um, if you were making some maps but couldn't use color, how would you go about shading areas using things like crosshatches? Yeah, um, generally speaking, that's, that is a valid way. Sorry, I'm, my headphone cable is caught up in my chair. Um, yeah, you can use non-color related things, uh, but today's lecture is on color. So yes, if you're doing black and white mapping, um, generally speaking, you should use uh, black and white color maps. And some of these show up pretty well um, in black and white. Others will not. So you just need to kind of be aware of the medium that you're, you're mapping for. Yeah, if, you, if you're working in black and white, obviously color isn't going to be as easy. But as pretty much everything is going digital, um, from different kinds of media to uh, lots and lots of cartography, uh, color is kind of the main burgeoning area of interest. So I can appreciate that there's an interest in, in learning that. But I, as I would say, kind of the cartography education I received suggested that that is somewhat archaic. And it makes your maps look old fashioned. Um, in a bad way. So I like it. Uh, I use it in Python, but I'm not quite sure off the top of my head how to do shading and cross-hatching in R. There's probably a way, um, but I'm not sure. So what I just wanted to show again is that colorblindness um, is, uh, you know, lots of these things have um, colorblindness modes, which give you better maps to use for people that are colorblind. The main things that you want to avoid when making um, plots that colorblind people can access is that you want to compare things based on both hue and brightness. So you don't want to have, um, you know, two groups that are about as saturated as one another. Uh, you want to kind of make sure that they are distinctive. Um, so this is what I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about color maps here. Um, and then there are examples in the assignment code of using uh, color maps. Uh, from Color Brewer. But there's one more thing I want to show you. Uh, actually, two more things with related to color in R. So there's also another um, domain of concern with color maps, especially the continuous ones, that's called perceptual uniformity. So what this means generally is that human beings interpret some colors as kind of louder than other colors. So in some classic color maps, you'll see one online called Jet, which is basically like one variant of a rainbow color map. Human eyes will see yellow as kind of more distinct from the colors around it 
then it will see various shades of blues and pinks. So when you're making a map, particularly based on continuous color maps, you might need to be careful about this if you have a transition through a really bright yellow into a really bright color next to yellow in the color map. There, people perceive those colors to be sort of more strongly or rapidly moving between hues. Uh, so like if, if you show something with a very smooth gradient, but it has a yellow part, people will see it as changing faster, basically. So there's a whole family of color maps that are put out by the Berkeley Institute for Data Science and builds on some earlier work on what are called perceptually uniform color maps. It just so happens that Cynthia Brewer's color brewer maps, uh, and I know it's not only yellow, there's like a collection of different hues, um, but it's not like Again, this isn't like a platonic fact that yellow causes things to change faster. It's about the relationship of the, the color's apparent brightness to the other things in the color map. So it can vary by color map. And I'm just talking about in the rainbow, like if you, depending on how you arrange it, um, certain colors will appear to move more quickly or indicate change faster than others. So this is all about how you're shifting between hues. Human beings see some colors as brighter than others, even when in the computer we have controlled them to have the same brightness. So this is like saying, you know, if I take the 256 colors in a, in a standard terminal and I put them on, a, put them right next to one another, and I move from left to right, some areas are going to seem way more distinctive than others. So even though they are algorithmically, numerically the same brightness, uh, they are not perceived that way. And Tom's question, could we change the brightness to make them perceived as the same brightness? Hell yeah, we can, because that's exactly what a perceptually uniform color map is. So here, the lighter blues are obviously brighter than the darks. In this case, this color map is called viridus. And viridus, is a perceptually uniform color map. In a perceptually uniform color map, you're, you're supposed to perceive that all of the colors from the darkest to the brightest have the same kind of apparent brightness. So if we were just to use like a standard blue and a standard yellow in this color map and then map between them using a green, you would generally speaking see the yellow as way brighter than the blue. But the argument from research is that we need to adjust how bright the yellow actually is in order to make that happen. So viridus, from the viridus package in R, is one of those color maps. It focuses on a mapping from blue to yellow that people have rated to be perceptually uniform. So if I'm making a map and I'm concerned about that, I might use something like viridus to do my visualizations. And viridus works by using these scale fill viridus commands, and you can have it be continuous or bit like before. Now, I don't really like viridus because I don't really like green in my maps. And I know that that's like a weird thing, but like aesthetically, it's just like not my shit. So I don't really use it. Instead, there are other color maps provided by the Viridus package, like this one. This is the Inferno color map. Inferno takes you from a purple to a yellow and does so in a perceptually uniform way. I like, or sorry, this is Plasma. I like Plasma, and if you read any of my journal articles or you know, look at anything I put online. I try and make it using plasma color maps if I can, because I like I like the way it looks. Just think it's aesthetically pleasing. Another one is the Inferno color map, which takes you from a black to a yellow off white, and that's considered to be perceptually uniform in its brightness. 
Okay. Now there are other available color maps in the Viridis kind of family of products. And you can find that by looking into the Viridis package. So there's Civitis, Inferno, Magma, Plasma, and then I think they have um, a gray as well. Okay? So that is the Viridis package, spelled V-I-R-I-D-E-I-S. Now the next thing I want to show you is the Wes Anderson package. So there's a great package in, in uh, R that allows you to use Wes Anderson film themed colors in your visualizations. Oh, and by the way, you can use all these things in standard ggplot as well. It's not just about mapping. Uh, but here I'm showing you examples for mapping uh, on how to do this. So when you're thinking about using Wes Anderson palettes, you have to install this library called Wes Anderson. Um, I wrote the package in Python to do this, which is why I love showing Wes Anderson packages, because they're really fun. Um, and so using a Wes Anderson palette, uh, you can make a map like this, which some people might not think looks very good, but um, it's using the colors based on a uh, film, which is uh, The Life Aquatic with uh, Steve Zissou, I think. Um, and you can kind of represent the, the, the colors based on these color maps from these films. And the package is the Wes Anderson package. I'll put the link to the GitHub in the chat. Uh, and you can find some documentation there as well about the different kinds of color maps that are available. I tend to think that the Wes Anderson color maps look better when they're discrete. I think that they're better when they're paired like that. So you might want to use them uh, in sort of making different plots of um, kind of group level comparisons rather than maybe making maps because uh, maps uh, require that you have some really strongly balanced colors, uh, which Wes Anderson doesn't necessarily uh, do. But like, uh, let, let's see here. So something like, um, So generally speaking, when you're adjusting these kinds of custom plots, you're using a scale. And then you're using either scale fill or scale color. So scale fill brewer is going to be accessing color schemes that are available from color brewer. Uh, and then here I'm going to use the manual to indicate that I'm passing my own color map. And I'm going to use the Darjeeling limited color map here in my box plot. And I'll show you what that looks like here. It looks a little better when it's not on a map. Um, looks a little better when it's on, uh, on a plot like that. And I, I think, again, they're better for discrete, but uh, they're kind of fun um, if you're interested. And then there's also a bunch of different uh, ggplot themes that you can use that are kind of pre-configured sets of um, pre-configured sets of colors and lines and aesthetics and uh, that'll be uh, available as well. So if you ask, please can you expand your console in the R markdown so you can see all the code? Yeah, sure. There you go. Um, I posted this to uh, online and I, I just haven't linked it because I've been so um, pushed for time, uh, but it'll be in that file when I update that after this uh, lecture. So I just wanted to show you the different things about color today. Um, and the main takeaways are about uh, the use of color in mapping and plotting, um, the different kinds of color maps that exist. So 
remember in the classic view of cartography, you have sequential color maps, which you know go from some light value all the way down to some dark value. They can be single hue, where they go from white to a color, or they can be multi-hue, where they go from some lighter perception of one color to a different color. That's dark. You've also got diverging color maps, which have two different colors on the ends and a white or a yellow in the center. And they transition smoothly from the dark on one side to the dark on the other side. Uh, and they use their hue primarily to illustrate that there's an opposition between the two ends and some kind of middle value that makes sense. And finally, there is the what they call qualitative color maps, which are just based on these unique values. Um, and some of them. <coughs> <laughs> can have the uh, paired visualizations that help you kind of differentiate larger groups and subgroups. The next thing that we talked about, <laughs> thanks Patrick. Um, the next thing that we talked about is the perceptually uniform color maps. And these are best when you're concerned about uh, sort of visual comparisons based on the fact that people are maybe not the same in the way that they perceive how loud yellow is or how loud green is. Um, so these try and balance for that. And I've showed you Viridis, Plasma, and Inferno. And there's a couple others in the Viridis package. And then to close, I've shown you the Wes Anderson package, which allows you to specify your distinctive palettes if you want to use those. So here I'm using scale fill gradient to show like a continuous Steve Zissou um, color map. And I'm also showing you discrete uh, color maps for Darjeeling Limited. Kate number two asks, can you use Viridis for discrete variables? Hell yeah, you can. No one's going to stop you. Um, I think the uh, scale fill, fill Viridis B will give you a binned value of a continuous thing. And then I think scale fill viridis D is the discrete option. Yeah, there you go. So D is for discrete, B is for binned, and C is for continuous. So I just want to do these things. Um, If I wanted to specifically assign a palette, such as Bristol was red, Bath was green, and South Gloucestershire was yellow in the box plot I've made using Darjeeling 1, how would I do that? Well, there's two ways I can recommend. But the easiest way I would do it is by adjusting the ordering of the factor. So um, LA name is an order in the Wika data, or is a, is a, is a factor. <clears throat> And using the ordered function, you can specify an ordered factor. So if I wanted Bristol to be first, I would just reorder the, uh, the factor. So that would be something like, um, let's see here. So I might send that to mutate and say LA name is now equal to ordered LA name, where the levels are, uh, let's see, so that has to match exactly. So the levels would be Bristol City of, and then the next level, let's say, what did you want? You wanted Bristol was the red, Bath was the green. And then um, South Glow, Sester Shear, Glows. I hate spelling these kinds of things here because everybody likes to add all these extra vowels. Um, there we go. Okay, cool. And then, ah, I need to... Is that what you asked for, Noah? That's using the ordered function to change the order of a factor. So if you're using a discrete color map, then you can do that. Um, you also might be able to do it manually. So using the, sp the scale fill manual, um, I think I can specify like um, 
Uh, I don't know if anybody knows like HTML color codes, but like you should be able to specify like FF 33 CC and then like EE, I don't know, 54 FC and then maybe like, I don't know, 33 FF 44. And that'll interpret those as colors. So scale field manual is a very, very, um, a very flexible thing. <laughs> so I can I can just arbitrarily assign colors, and I can do that using <clears throat> like HTML or kind of things. I think I can do that using RGB uh, raw as numbers between zero and two five five. Um, yeah. So you can you can do a lot uh, with the color, but. My point was more to kind of encourage you towards using color maps that people have developed to be aesthetically pleasing and or uh, information dense rather than um, doing your own thing. Because uh, unless you're fancying yourself as a, a experienced designer, uh, there's been a lot of research on the different ways that you know using the wrong kind of visualization can mislead. So. Uh, no, I also ask, is it more complicated to combine binning with continuous variables? Um, in the sense that you're uh, compressing the amount of information shown, uh, it is actually more complicated to um, use a continuous map. Uh, but when you say, I guess, binning continuous variables and you want to change the order in which the bins are assigned, uh, then you'd need to kind of do the binning manually probably and plot that as a discrete thing yourself, which some people do. You know, if if you have data that you want to preserve in a particular order, then you can just kind of map it numerically to the color map and use a bunch of if else statements to do that. Uh, so it is more complicated, um, but basically what you're doing in that case is you're kind of manually assigning each value or value set a color. Um, and there's no easy way to do that. You, you have to write that code yourself, basically. Color maps are there to be kind of a good default. Uh, but when you want to get really finicky, um, it, it's kind of hard. So yeah, no problem. Cool. OK, that's all I wanted to talk about today um, was color. And as you've noticed, I've also gradually gotten louder as I've been lecturing. Uh, this is why my voice is shot at the end of a week now. Um, but it's good to talk to you, and I just was really glad to show you color because it's like my favorite thing uh, about computer cartography. Um, and I wouldn't write packages to give people Wes Anderson colors if I didn't think it was important. So this isn't my package, but my package is in R or in in Python, I should say. But I I do think that these are really fun. They just kind of make things easier and 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 are neat to use. So cool. Um,